Hello and welcome to this, the third in the series Language, Culture and Myths, the series organised by the Hellenic Centre and the Cambridge Centre for Greek Studies, running throughout March. A very warm welcome to all of you. I'm going to be talking, my name is Tim Whitmarsh, I'm going to be talking today about Greek poetry in the Roman Empire, and in particular about a project that I ran with some other people, it ran between Oxford and Cambridge from 2014 to 2017. And what we were trying to do, essentially, is to reappraise the Greek poetic pr production, and particularly the epic poetic production, in the era of the Roman Empire, an era that is often thought of in terms of prose, but less commonly thought of as a, as, as a time of great flowering of uh, poetry. But I want to begin just um, from basics, really, and think a little bit about how we construct periods in our head. And I want to begin with one of the most influential classicists of the United Kingdom, uh, Mr. Michael Gove. He is, of course, actually, I'm being serious at one level, he is uh, an influential figure because his educational reforms have had a lasting influence. But I was thinking more of a comment that he made in December 2013, for which he was uh, derided. Uh, there's no other way to put it, really. Uh, what he said was, um, there's children, uh, there's children, there are children, surely, Michael, uh, including my own, who can't remember, well, perhaps didn't even know in the first place, whether the Romans, Egyptians or the Greeks came in which particular order, and whether or not the Vikings were their antagonists, protagonists, sons or daughters. Uh, this is a rather perplexing quote for a number of reasons, but one of them clearly is this sense that the Romans, the Egyptians and the Greeks belong to discrete historical periods. And if we look on Wikipedia's timeline of ancient history, we can see a similar sort of implication. Uh, this is roughly the period of Egyptian. Um, uh, we don't get much mention of Egyptian as you get further down it. This is uh, obviously the left-hand column is uh, dates BCE. And the first mention that we get of Greece is the archaic, uh, of archaic Greece here, going down to classical period and Hellenism. Uh, by which they mean the Hellenistic period. So that is the Greeks. And then we get the Romans, and presumably we're supposed to imagine them running through to late antiquity down there. So you do get from Wikipedia as well a Gove-like sense of the compartmentalizing, compartmentalization of historical periods around the dominance of certain groups. And this is a very familiar way of thinking about things. And of course, at one level, it facilitates education for the young. Um, you know, you can say that all sorts of strategic simplifications occur in order to make things palatable and assimilable by the young. But of course, it also has deep distorting effects, not least uh, the imposition of a kind of imperial political model. Because what these periods are doing, this periodization is doing, is it's focusing attention on periods of political and military dominance. So the Egyptian period is the period where uh, Egypt is in control of its own destiny. The uh, Roman period, the Greek period is the period of Greek um, freedom and conquest and empire. And the Roman period is the period of Roman domination. So the effect of thinking about things in these ways is to absorb a broadly imperialist way of constructing chronology. And it also means that you're led into thinking of um, artifacts and literary works that are produced outside of these windows in a less uh, wholesome way. Now, in this timeline here, you can see that the Greeks come relatively late. Of course, there were inhabitants of the Greek peninsula much earlier than that. People were speaking Greek on the Greek peninsula much earlier than that. We know that from Minia B. Um, and of course, Greeks continue to speak and write Greek right through uh, till the present day. Uh, so Gove was wrong uh, and deleteriously wrong uh, to suggest that the Greeks occupied a particular temporal niche and should be compartmentalized then and were superseded by the Romans. That's a very destructive way of thinking of things. Uh, now, when we're talking about Greek poetry, I've given you a little sort of summary on the in the right hand column here. These are supposed to line up sort of pretty much with the um, the dates on the left hand column. But you can see that Homer and Hesiod uh, 
um, let's say, 8th century BCE. Um, there were all sorts of issues, of course, about when and how Homer and Hesiod's texts were created. A tragedy and comedy, 5th century BCE. Apollonius of Rhodes, um, a major epic poet writing in the Hellenistic period in the early 3rd century BCE. Um, and I'm going to throw some names at you here that, that may be less familiar. Uh, Oppian and Quintus in the 2nd century AD or CE, if you prefer, and Nonus in the 5th century CE. They'll be important to our story. So the point here, really, the simple point that I'm trying to make is that uh, Homer and Hesiod are the earliest epics, but of course they're not the last epics uh, written in Greek. And in fact, we have much more Greek epic poetry written from the period of the Roman Empire than we do have from the earlier periods. And that goes actually for all forms of literature. It's just a, an extraordinarily um, uh, creative period and we have an awful lot of material from the Roman Empire. So pushing on, let's just think a little bit about what literary canons are. Um, let's build off the back of Revial Netz's recent book, Scale, Space and Canon in Ancient Literary Culture, which is a really um, extraordinarily sophisticated way of thinking through what a literary canon is. But I do think it has one particular flaw in the sense that it thinks of the canon in terms of the classical canon, in, in the sense that um, it maps out a story of how literature composed in the archaic and classical periods came to assume centrality in later periods. And that is clearly undeniable at one level. By the time that we get to the second century AD, when the majority, when we have a, a richest papyrological source and we can trace what people were actually reading by through their literary remains, at least, uh, sorry, their physical remains of the books, at least in Greece. Uh, by the time we get to that period, it is absolutely beyond doubt that Homer, Euripides, Menander, these were the big authors. But there was also, and I think this is one of the things that this, that, um, this book, um, for all its brilliance, disguises, there was also, in the second century, a sort of re-canonization and an embrace of new forms of literature. And let me just give you one example here, which is the novel, Achilles, Tatius, Leucippe and Clytophone, was, I have argued, the most influential text of the second century CE. And I argue that on the basis of two things, really. One is the number of papyri that survive from it. We have eight papyri of Achilles, Tatius from seven different texts. And you can compare the, the only other authors of the second century who have anything like that are Galen and Plutarch. You can see we've got seven papyri of Galen, nine of Plutarch. But if you think how much Galen there is, um, there will, uh, an edition of Galen would fill your wall. Uh, this is all, also an awful lot of Plutarch. Achilles, Tatius and Leucippe is a relatively slender novel. So the fact that we've got eight papyri from it is testimony, I think, to its extraordinary impact. And the other way in which we can trace that impact is in terms of the way that later writers absorb and reprocess aspects of Achilles, Tatius' novel. Uh, it's an erotic novel, so the primary impact is in the world of um, the erotic, as you would expect. But it's not the only area of impact. It's extraordinary, really, that Christians uh, get into this, uh, what is actually quite a dirty novel, and um, the steadfastness of the lovers and their devotion to each other, which has its limit, I have to say, in this novel, uh, becomes a sort of model for Christian endurance and steadfastness in devotion to God. And Achilles' descriptions of gardens, for example, become very influential on later descriptions of the Garden of Eden. So it's quite a tangled story, quite an interesting story there about the reception of Achilles Tatius, but it is re-canonised in the way that I've described. But we're not talking about novels, they're, they're written in prose. What I want to talk about is instead verse. And in particular, let's take another example, an example of another text from the second century CE, uh, Opians Haliutica, or Things to Do with the Sea, which is a five-book hexameter poem on the, at first sight, rather inauspicious topic of the sea and its inhabitants. Uh, the subject of a recent book, which you can see the cover of, or a smidge of the cover of, on the left there. This is one of the books that written by a co-investigator on the project that I mentioned earlier, the 
Oxford and Cambridge project, uh, Emily Kneebone. So um, why is Oppian so successful? Well, at least where, how can we trace its success? Well, one is, once again, in terms of uh, papyri, we have five papyri of Oppian. I should say as, as a bit of context to this, the second century AD is the period of peak papyrological production and the number of papyri that we have from the third and the fourth century tail off quite rapidly. So in fact, um, if you're a second century author, your chances of being preserved in the papyrological record are infinitely less than if you are a Hellenistic or a classical writer. So Oppian and Achilles have done really well to get the number of papyri preserved that they have. We can also see echoes of Oppian, um, more than echoes really, a really strong direct impact on later uh, epic poets. Pseudo-Oppian, as you would might imagine, is very heavily influenced by Oppian. What we mean by pseudo-Oppian is that this is a poem um, about hunting on land that was attributed to Oppian in antiquity, but now we don't think to be opinion, uh, Oppianic. We think it's um, attempting to look like Oppian rather than actually being by Oppian. A nonus that the major fifth century epic poet that I mentioned earlier. We have four ancient biographies of Oppian, we have a paraphrase of Oppian, and we have a commentary on Oppian. So these are quite difficult to date, but that's not really my point. Um, my point is that Oppian remains canonical um, in late antiquity in through into the Byzantine period as well. So an extraordinarily impactful author Oppian is. And in fact, actually, we have over 800 attested epic poems composed between the 1st and 7th centuries CE. We don't have all 800. You'd be probably grateful to, to learn. A lot of these are just titles or allusions in other texts. Um, but as I say, when we in our project, we created a database and we found an extraordinary number of these poems. Related in a slightly tangential way, the epigrams of the Greek anthology, which are written in, not in epic hexameters, but in the epigrammatic or elegiac form of hexameter followed by <coughs> pentameter. Um, there's a huge corpus of stone inscriptions, um, some of which I, we've counted in our 800 attested epic poems. Uh, they've been recently edited by Merkelbach and Stauber. So incredibly rich, a uh, wide ranging set of texts um, that could be broadly associated with epic in the Roman Empire. And I've given you some fully surviving texts there. This isn't a, a, an a, a ex exclusive list. There are many more, the Orphic Argonautica, the Sibylline Oracles, if you want to count them, um, Manitho's uh, um, astrological poem, the Apotelus Matica, uh, for example, I haven't listed those here. But very briefly, um, these are the most, I suppose, the most alluring, most fun ones. Dionysius's description of the world, it's a short poem, about um, just over a thousand lines long, which um, has Dionysius imagining himself in effect flying over the world and describing it from a bird's eye perspective. Oppian's Things to Do with the Sea or Haleutica, I've mentioned an extraordinary poem that forms a kind of triptych with pseudo Oppian's Things to Do with Hunting in the third century CE. Um, so Oppian does the sea, as pseudo Oppian does land, and we have a prose paraphrase of another poem by a guy called Dionysius, which is about how to catch birds, which does the air, if you like. So it's a tripartite triptych of texts there written by different authors. Quintus of Smyrna's The Events After Homer, an important poem that fills the narrative gap between the Iliad and the Odyssey. Uh, Trifiodorus's Capture of Troy, a fun little short poem uh, written in the third century CE or AD, if you prefer, which is um, gives you the end um, of Troy, Troy's capture by the wooden horse. Um, I mentioned it's fun. It's got a sort of um, playfulness to it, which is manifests itself firstly in the theme of boredom and weariness in the uh, initial lines. Everyone is just bored of the war going on and on and on and on. So they think, let's try and get it over done and done with as quickly as possible. And that's a sort of self-reflexive um, nod to the fact that Trifidorus's poem is a very short poem after the length of the Iliad. Nonus's Things to do with Dionysus or Dionysiaca is probably the most important um, 
dangerous thing to say perhaps, but uh, arguably the most important uh, epic poem from late antiquity. Um, an extraordinary 48 book episode, um, uh, epic poem on the adventures of Dionysus across the world, but inclu including in India. Nonus interestingly wrote this sort of um, rambunctious uh, Dionysiac poem, which um, exudes a sort of Dionysiac style, a sort of drunken poetics. Uh, but he also wrote a paraphrase of the Gospel of John. And for an awful long time, people have struggled to put these together. How do you put together a playful um, poem about Dionysus that has Dionysus conducting affairs, um, gay and straight affairs, sorry. Uh, how do you put that together with the fact that he seemingly wrote a fairly straight, not entirely straight, but fairly straight paraphrase of the Gospel of John? Uh, Nonis's paraphrase of the Gospel of John turns out to be a little bit Dionysiac after all, because the wedding at Cana, for example, the conversion of water into wine, has a sort of programmatic role in the text. Uh, and there are other strongly Dionysiac features in it. Nevertheless, it's clearly a Christian work, so a bit of a puzzle there. Um, Musaeus's Hero and Leander, 5th century CE, a poem, an epic poem, short epic poem, written on a Greek novelistic theme, the love of Hero and Leander. Hero lives in a tower, Leander, um, it's sort of Romeo and Juliet style thing. Um, they have to consummate their love secretly in the evenings because the parents don't approve, or at least um, Hero's parents don't approve. So Leander has to swim across the Hellespont every day until one day the light that Hero le leaves on top of the tower uh, goes out and Leander gets lost. He dies, he's washed up on the shore, Hero sees his body and throws herself off uh, and kills herself to be with her beloved. So it's uh, an interesting, uh, evocative poem that was very influential on people like Christopher Marlowe and I've argued David Bowie, uh, but that's a story for another day. Finally, Caluthus's Abduction of Helen in the 6th century CE, which uh, gives you the prequel to the Iliad, um, the judgment of the goddesses and the abduction of Helen and the beginning of the caca, of the problems of uh, uh, the Iliad. But I wanted to conclude, uh, as I promised in my, my uh, brief for this talk, I wanted to conclude by just pointing out that there are other forms of poetry available in the Roman Empire. We don't have to stick to high elite poetics in broadly the Homeric tradition. This is a little gem that I've just been working on in the last six months or so. And this is um, uh, um, a poem, I argue, that has been preserved on a number of different gemstones, about 19 or so different gemstones. I found this is a particularly spectacular example of it for reasons I'll talk about in a sec. But it's also preserved on a graffito in Spain, on a wall in Spain, which we just happen to have. So it's a very different kind of text. It's not a text that comes down to us through the manuscript tradition, through the, the high cultural tradition. It's something that is um, printed onto what are in effect mass produced accessories. This is a glass paste medallion here, um, cheap as chips. Um, it's not, um, you know, you still have to have a certain amount of disposable income to buy it, but it's not the, the cost of a papyrus roll, for example. Now, why do I call it a poem? Well, two reasons, at least two reasons. One is that uh, it's actually laid out like a kind of visual poem on the page. We know that this is an era where people are beginning to think about visual poetry, poetry that makes shapes. They've been thinking about it for a while, actually, in all sorts of ways. But um, uh, but in the, the later Roman, uh, I should say that this, this gem dates to about the second century CE. Uh, but as we move into the later Roman Empire, the third or fourth century CE, we get more elaborate plays with the form of letters on the page. And you can see here that on the left hand column, uh, I'm not sure that my pen's working particularly well there, but you can see that there's been an attempt to try and create symmetry there. And we've got some on the right hand column there as well. So it's a sort of pattern text. 
is poetic in that sense, but it's poetic also in another really interesting way, I think. It's got some traces of conventional quantitative meter in it, um, by which I mean long vowels and short vowels, which is the classical and archaic way of creating poetic meter. But it also has a stress rhythm in it. That's to say, it's, um, I think, one of the earliest examples of what became the dominant way of producing um, metrical effects in the Byzantine uh, era and going forward, which is to say through the stress accent, which had in phonetics replaced the quantitative system. Um, uh, anyway, so the poem says, um, it says, they say what they say, let them say it, I don't care, go and love me, it does you good. So it's um, a stuff them poem, it's a countercultural poem, it's very reminiscent of um, Catullus's poem where he says, um, let us live lesbian, let us love and let's um, count the rumours of old men at nothing. Um, so I think it's quite interesting in terms of the, the, the way in which it positions itself as a poem that's about attitude and about a sort of aggressive positioning of the, the self against dominant culture. But as I say, I think it's also intriguing that it's got this stress rhythm in it, which you can see if you don't read Greek, you can see in the middle column there, that the first of four syllables is stressed in uh, an emphatic form. A legusin ha thelusin legetosan umelimoi suphiline sunferi soi. Um, the same rhythm actually as the Beatles fixing a hole, if you're interested in that. So it gives us a, just a little reminder that as well as the high poetic production that is relatively conservative and takes um, its cue from the Homeric poems, this is an era in which poet, poetics on the ground is changing and transforming and the, the, the shifts are underway already to take us into the world of Byzantine and indeed into modern Greek poetics. Thank you very much for listening. I hope you enjoy the rest of the series.